um, for that. Right, has everybody got some popcorn? Cool. Yeah, just keep passing it around. Um, so this is a presentation um, on, it's called PowerPoints to Crush, but it's about sort of technology as a whole and sort of things that we can use, uh, the ways we can use the technology and employ it with our teaching. Uh, it's called PowerPoint to Crutch because I think sometimes we can just rely solely on PowerPoint and forget about the other things. So we're just going to introduce a few things to you, maybe some things you already know about, uh, fair enough. Um, certainly I'm not saying this is the only way you can ever do a PowerPoint, but it's how I would do one. And so it'll be a bit of my personal story as well, so that's a bit X factor, it's really I'm going to talk about my journey through PowerPoints. Um, I'm also going to be giving this to the ACPs. Um, this is James. This is uh, James Platt giving me the mission to, to do this talk for the ACPs. That is still <laughs> I think he makes a very good Judy Dench. That's surprisingly. Yeah, he's not very happy about this slide. <laughs> Uh, but I think that shows that this is something that's being considered by other people. So it's not just in an education environment like here, uh, but uh, everybody who's doing sort of teaching, thinking about how we can best use uh, technology in our teaching. So I'd like to be as interactive as possible. I know you've all got a mouthful of popcorn and things. Feel free to just put your hand up and make comments as we go along. Um, I'm going to start with this. This is not one of my slides, but this is an example of the slides that were here in Dream. This is a Dream slide that was being used in teaching when I came along to Dream. Anybody like to shout out some thoughts about this slide? Positive, negative, neutral? What do you think? Busy? Yeah? Yeah, I don't really know what's going on. Lots of random words? It looks more like it was done to help the memory of the person who was talking to people who knows that they need to talk about rather than yeah. understanding. Yeah? Everybody understand the abbreviations? No. no. Who doesn't understand the abbreviations? Yeah, so, uh, to be honest, even I've struggled with a couple of them, and I, I am a sort of doctor, so. Um, but you can see kind of probably what the person was doing, uh, was thinking about when they came up with this. It's about history taking, but it's just kind of a not particularly effective slide. Okay. And then this chat came along to dream. Um, one of our uh, one of our alumni, uh, Dom, with a suspicious camera angle, uh, taking this uh, photo of himself. He was. <laughs> He's all crying now over Sheffield Wednesday. Uh, and he introduced me to the work of this chap. You may have heard of him. He's called uh, Ross Fisher, and he's a paediatric uh, oncology surgeon over at uh, Sheffield now, I believe he is, um, did work at Leicester. And he does uh, a lot of talks on this concept of PQ presentations, and I'll introduce that concept, um, about a way of improving our presentations, about making our presentations more than just relying on PowerPoint. And he has his own website, I'll put the link up to it at the end, but it's a really good website, it's one that sort of inspired me a lot. And he does a lot of talking at SMAC, so hopefully he might talk at uh, SMAC next month when Jack and I there. Um, and he says, he criticises those slides like I just put up there, that earlier one. And he uses the film Blade Runner to illustrate his point. Um, I do not mind plagiarising him because Blade Runner is a brilliant, brilliant movie. Has anyone ever seen it? Yes, yes, we've got a few. Brilliant. Uh, and this is, um, it's one of my favourite films. I thought you forgot about me, this presentation. Uh, this is uh, the android um, Roy, just as he's about to shut down. He delivers this beautiful uh, soliloquy, improvised by the actor, to Harrison Ford's character, telling him about the beautiful things he's seen in his short life. I just want you to watch it and think about some of the great, some of the teaching that you've seen, some of the teaching you've developed, you've delivered, some of the teaching that you've sat in. Just imagine that he's talking about that. Hopefully, no. I 
I watched the scene do this. Literally the task made me tear out of me. All those moments we lost. Time. Like tears. will be lost in time, like the years in rain. All that brilliant teaching you think you've developed, really, all those moments when you've sat in a lecture theatre and you've seen this world expert or something teach, and as soon as you walk out, it's gone, because it's not delivered properly. The amount of times I've sat in a lecture theatre thinking, this is going to be amazing, because it looks great on paper, and it's just the other bits that fall apart. And that's where the PQ format comes in. P1, the story, P2, the media, how you're use, what you're using, and then P3, your delivery. And all those three bits together makes PQ. And that's the format that Ross Fisher talks about. That's what I'm going to talk about a bit now. So the first thing is story. Essentially, at its bare base level, all education is a story. Think back to tribes, a son returned to his father, where did the world come from? And you'd have myths, you'd have legends, you'd have a story to say this is where it came from, that's where education came from. And that's the same even now. Even if you're doing a session on an ECG, you've got a story to tell about what an ECG is and how we do it. And in that way, you have to approach it like a storyboard. You can't just rush to the computer and start writing down everything you know on a few slides. You've got a storyboard it. And this is the storyboard for this session. You can read my hand uh, in the middle, I put sort of my key points I wanted to get across, and in this way, I sort of imagined it as a bit like the, um, the elevator pitch. You've got 30 seconds to go to the top, what's your core message that you want to get across. I'm going to talk to you about the PQ approach, tell you about my PowerPoint journey, and then talk about some of the things that I use, like memes, tweet deck, and mentor me to get onto a bit, and then going through it like that. Okay. And you've got to get down to the absolute base level of what you want to talk about. We'll know who this is? Yes, the king of cool. First thing he did whenever he got a script, cross out loads of the lines that somebody had written for him. He wanted to say the absolute bare minimum. He said, I don't do exposition. He was only going to say something if it was relevant and if it drove the plot forward. And we have to do the same in our teaching because we can't cover everything. This is one of Dom's favorite slides. This is an artist who covered the Reichstag building. But we can't do that. I could do a day session where I could do everything I know about the Q album, but I know that within an hour I'll have lost most of my audience. And by the end of it, they're still going to go away and make mistakes and things, even though I think that I've covered it. Okay. It's because it's not delivered properly and you're not concise enough. What you can do, though, is put on a session that introduces some core concepts and inspire your learners to go on, either on the shop floor or through books, to learn a bit more. You may think that there isn't as much of a story to tell in something you're doing such as ECG, but for that I draw your attention to Raiders of the Lost Ark, another one of my favourite films. I want you to imagine five-year-old Jamie borrowing his mum's satchel, pretending to be Indiana Jones, crawling under some tables, <laughs> pretending I was Indiana Jones. Did you have the hat? I did have the hat, and I had a sort of a jacket, and I took the belt off my dressing gown, and that was my whip. And I was an inventive child. But anybody who's watched uh, The Big Bang Theory will tell you there's a major problem with, uh, with uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, and that is there isn't actually a story. Indiana Jones is sent to stop the Nazis getting the Lost Ark. They get the Lost Ark. They open it like they would have done without Indiana Jones. It melts them like it would have done without Indiana Jones, and they all die like they would have done without Indiana Jones. He has absolutely nothing to do with the story. And yet, George Lucas and Steven Spielberg make a 90-minute blockbuster that creates an iconic hero you could recognize just from the silhouette and creates a franchise that even manages to survive Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. <laughs> I still want my refund after that. 
you can make something out of anything at the point in time. This is a slide that I put at the beginning of my uh, DKA talk, and I started to illustrate another point about thinking about our audience. I'm a bit of a geek. I like this sort of thing. This is a molecule of insulin. I thought it looked pretty cool. First time I delivered this session, somebody looked at this and said, oh, is it going to be one of those boring doctor presentations? Because they thought I was just going to talk about molecules and things like that. What was something quite interesting and just a neat talking point for me turned off somebody in my audience. I was going, no, 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 it's not about that, it's just about this. So we always have to think about our audience. Some day, somewhere like in Dream, where we've got people coming from the community, people with different backgrounds, we always have to go into what do they actually need me to talk about? Does such and such need me to actually tell them about how um, you know, uh, the conduction pathway in the heart, or do they just need to know about the lead placement? What's the actual, what they need to get down to it? The next part is media. Okay. So this is an example of a cave painting. I think it illustrates the point I'm trying to make here. We know nothing about the people that painted this. We don't know what language they use. We don't know anything about them. But just by looking at this picture, we know exactly what they're on about. It was five people, went hunting, two of them had bows and arrows, three had spears. They came across, I'm guessing, a doe and a stag, and they went hunting. That's it. A lot can be said with pictures that can't be said with letters or words. I think we found with all the horrible news at the moment, pictures be a lot more powerful than anything that's ever put, in, put down in print. So this brings on to a very key point that Ross Fisher talked about. Guns don't kill, bullet points do. And it's a fact that if you put up a picture and talk and teach in front of this picture, that is better for your uh, audience, they retain more, than if you stand next to a whole load of bullet points. What's also improved is that standing next to a completely blank screen and talking, your audience retains more than if you've got bullet points. Bullet points kill. If you put anything up on a screen, people will read it. This is an example, this is my mobile phone contract. <laughs> We are tuned to pattern recognize, words are patterns. You will just start reading. You will start reading, and while you're reading, you're not listening to me. Even if I tell you not to read, you will still read. <laughs> if you put something up there, even though I'm saying to you, do not read what is on this screen, you will read. And I'm guaranteed you've all gone down to the bottom. It's pointless, waste of time. Okay. There is a finite amount of cognitive load that people can take, even ladies. There's only so much multitasking we can do. Okay. You're making your audience like that. You've got a whole load of words and somebody talking, and they're trying to make notes. It's just too much. And your audience are not going to take anything away from the session that you're delivering. The heart is a pump. It has four chambers. The aorta carries oxygenated blood away from the heart to the body. Well, I mean, what's the point of me in that moment? What's the point if I'm just going to stand here and read what's off a picture of the audience? I may as well not be there. Your audience may as well be at home, just with the slides, going through in their bedroom. Yeah. That's a bit better, but does it really need the heart annotation? The key point of this is to illustrate, not to annotate. That's a bit better. That's even better. Nice picture. I can talk about this. Okay, so there's the aorta, there's the brachiocephalic trunk, there's the uh, left common carotid, there's the left subclavian artery. I can do all that. I've got the knowledge. I don't need that as a prop. I can just point to it and it's, you know, use that to illustrate the points I'm trying to make. And just doesn't that look just a lot nicer? Just a whole load of words about the heart. Brian Cox, another hero of mine. Here he is on tour. Two big screens dedicated to him, because he's Brian Cox. And then just a nice picture behind him. Doesn't need any arrows saying, there's a star, that's a nebula. Doesn't insult his audience. It's just there it is. It's a nice sort of thing. And he's the centre of attention with those nice big pictures of him in the book that he's probably trying to get. That sort of thing on pictures, I want to talk a little bit more about fonts now. Who likes that font? 
no one likes Comic Sans. It's the black sheep of the family, isn't it? So um, when I was talking to Nick from the university about uh, putting on a PowerPoint presentation for UMEC this year, it says there at the bottom, we do not do Comic Sans. In very good. We do not do Comic Sans. Why is that? Why do, why do people not like Comic Sans? Mm. It's a bit messy, doesn't it? I quite like it. I knew you were going to say something, Ali, yeah. Uh, Ali likes it. He asked me the other day, and I'm surprised he hasn't answered me. I do. I don't know why, it's not, I think it's not about me, it's just lovely. Yeah. No. So, some places, you know, do you say, don't do comics and windings as well, or uh, things like that. You What's winding? Winding is another font. It's just simple. It's basically just symbols. It's rubbish. Um, yeah, based like hieroglyphics. So you could think, okay, does this look professional? Is it professional if my words come in swooping with sound effects, like something like a 10-year-old did at school, anything like that? You could think things like that. Does anyone prefer that? No. No? Why do you not prefer that? Capitals. Mm. So that's Times New Roman, a nice sensible font. Um, but it's a bit shouty, isn't it? Some people say, oh, capitals, you know, aortic aneurysm is dangerous. It's dangerous. That is a the point, isn't it? What about that? After the three? Yeah. This is Blueberry, yeah. It does have a bullet point in everything. The fact of the matter is, it's easier to read a word that is in lowercase than it is to read in capitals. If you are going to get your audience to read, this is a lot easier. Because we see a word as a shape, not as actually letter by letter, that is a lot easier for people to read. That's why um, road signs are written in the lowercase, because it's read quicker. So that can be read quicker than you can. But I would propose a different way of thinking about it, going, because I want to talk about AAA, I want my audience to go away with something memorable. AAA is dangerous. AAA, what can I do? Can I create a saying out of that? So I would come up with a slide a bit like this now. I would have that rather than saying something, AAA is dangerous, I have some AAA batteries, don't delay anything AAA. Something memorable for my audience to go away from. Think about. So this is an example of, a, this is one of my slides, so please be gentle. Um, this is a slide that I made in my first month here in Green, talking about uh, head injuries and when you need to do a CT head. So the sort of criteria. I think we can agree, not very good. To be honest, I'm a big boy. No? No. Yeah. I can't bother to read my first verse. Yeah. No. Yeah. Bullet points. So this is the thing with bullet points, isn't it? Because bullet points sort of makes you think there's a hierarchy. So is this point less important than the top point? Because it sort of starts going in, bullet point changes, it implies the hierarchy. If it does go on to a second slide, is the second slide as important as the first slide? So now, I think, you know, when I had to do a talk to the fifth year medical students on CT head management a few months ago, I thought, how can I do best do this as a picture? It took me about 20 minutes, as opposed to just writing this out, which took a few minutes. I came up with something like this. So it's just a case of Googling some images, getting some silhouettes, changing some colours around, but it's all got the same information that the previous slide had about the, necess um, the necessary uh, factors that you need to have in order to uh, scan somebody's head with a head injury. Are they vomiting? Are they on anything to thin their blood? Have they got panda eyes? So the bruising around the eyes. Any seizure activity? Are they unconscious or low GCS? It's all there. And I think that's a bit more memorable than just a whole load of script. So this is sort of going through my mind when I'm stood up in front of the nurses and CSWs talking about DKA. This is basically what I've got to say to my uh, audience. What is DKA? Da, 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 da. This is essentially what I was saying. You put all that on the side, it's an awful lot, isn't it? Uh, you may notice if you do read down to the bottom, I left a little thing about it. To say, <laughs> to say that I love James, as I do. <laughs> so, Mel and Kat asked me to talk about DKA, so I think, how's the best way to talk about DKA? I could talk about DKA, I could show some pictures. But I decided to be a bit creative 
and do some shapes moving around on the, board, on the screen. So this is what I came up with. Apologies for those of you who've seen this already. Uh, here's your blood. These white circles are uh, glucose molecules. You go and eat, you, break, um, you digest your food, your blood glucose goes up, your body makes insulin, that binds to the cells of your body like that, opens up channels, and makes the sugar leave your blood, going to the cells where it can use its energy. Nice and simple, that didn't take any great amount of coding, it's just using simple things that are on PowerPoint. And then talking about what happens in DKA, so your patient with diabetes eats, their blood sugar goes up, but there's no insulin, so they have to break down fat instead, because they can't use the sugar. So that breaks up, makes ketones in the blood, so you've got somebody who's got a high blood sugar, ketones, and they're acidotic. It illustrates the point, it's simple, didn't take any great uh, amount of skill on my part, but it looks so much better, I think, and engages better, I think, than it does if I just put that out in words. Even though it doesn't mention that I love James Pat on this bit, I just have to say that. This is another example of a slide that I did when I first came to dream. So you can see here I'm trying to make a bit of an effort with some red flags. I'm trying to make it look interesting. But I think, I think it fails a little bit. Whereas now I come up with something like this. So this is an example of a meme. M-E-M-E. -M -E. Okay. This is what is known as a skeptical African child meme. I believe that's what it's called, isn't it? And you can see all of these on the internet. Usually they have a sort of a political theme to them. So it might be, so you think Trump won without Putin, something like that. So it's about getting a point across. But increasingly they are being used in education because I think that gets across a message a lot better than me putting it down in words. It's a bit funny, sort of conveys an emotion as well. Hmm, you know, this is how somebody would look to me on the shop floor if I said, oh, I think they're just drunk. I know that Matt, Sam, Kat, other Matt will go, are you sure, Jamie? You sure you don't want to scan their head? You know, I know that. And they're very easy to make these. So all you need to do is Google meme generator, and there's all of these ones you can come find them. And uh, this is the Morpheus meme, where he goes, what if I told you? So you can put something like, what if I told you you were presenting wrong? Generate, it's free, and then that goes into the slide. And it's sort of nice and easy. All free, absolutely free. Just more examples of the things that I've done. So this is one that I do with the uh, third year as part of their chest pain thing. This is their opening slide. Just a bit of silliness. So this is Fry from Futurama, something like that. Short of air, tachycardia, sweating, feeling of impending doom, my differential diagnosis, you're either right, having a heart attack, you're about to do an oscar. So, you know, a bit silly, a bit fun. This is the cool ski dude from uh, Futurama, oh, not Futurama, from South Park even, South Park even, who's going through the safety talk. If this happens, you're going to have a bad time. If this happens, you're going to have a bad time. If you forget the you also, you're going to have a bad time. Again, it's like that safety talk about when it comes to the uh, abdominal pain, if you forget about the aorta, you're going to have a bad time. You've always got to think about uh, aortic perception, aortic rupture. Right, this is another one I like to use in my collapse talk. She collapsed because aliens. This is a guy from a History Channel documentary who put down everything to aliens. So the pyramids are aliens, the Great Wall of China was put there by aliens. If you go around going, I, if you put down collapse query cause as a diagnosis, that's not a diagnosis, you're silly. You're just like this guy who believes that everything is put down to aliens. There's always a reason why somebody fell. So this is the slide that I use to put that point on. Bit silly, bit fun, but I think it conveys a point a lot better than just putting it down in words. Finally, we need to look at the delivery. So it's no point having amazing story to tell, amazing media, if you're just going to spend, hi everyone, I'm going to talk to you today about aortic aneurysm. It's just bad. And we've all been in that talk where you actually feel anxious because the guy on the stage is just like, oh, hello, and it's just awkward, and let people stop to listen. People stop listening. Or, you know, nativity presentation, you know, nativity plays and things like that. So, I'm just going to show a couple of examples of two more of my heroes, one sadly departed, uh, telling a story, and both showing a different way of how to present and to tell a story. Well, I think both are very effective. I'm going to try and skip the profanity bit. 
think I'm timing this right. Let's go. Brazilians go, look, I'm playing soccer, okay? Look, I'm scoring. And now I'm kicking the ball. The soccer's gone kind of level. You know, it's a little passive aggressive though when you got that thing of like, yeah. Swearing. So that's Robin Williams, throwing himself about on stage, different voices, moving himself about. Here's the David Attenborough though, telling a story. And all he's doing is just sat there. Really like this, uh, today, you know, because you've done such well over the years, you've been on occasion, you've been in all sorts of extraordinary situations, you've seen them or remember them. What, was, what were the times when you felt most in danger, when you really thought, this might be it? Not very often, actually. I suppose the time when I really thought maybe this was not going, going too well uh, was when I was in, with a very great expert, an uh, uh, East African expert, knew about big game, was a great elephant expert. And I was traveling with him in a land river uh, through to a Africa. And uh, we were driving on perfectly happily, and, uh, and I heard a sort of and my expert friend said, did you hear that? I said, what? He said, well, that, that noise down here. He said that was a, a, we were charged by a rhino. I said, really? Oh, it's a dummy charge. That's what they do with dummy charge. They, they chum up and they just charge and then they drive off. And they bother at all. So I said, oh, very interesting. And then suddenly there was this noise again. And this time it ended with a boom. <laughs> The Land Rover was picked up by its horns on the, from the back end. Sure, like that. Yeah, and, of course, the <laughs> and, and I saw this chap's hand, remember his hands on the steering wheel, white knuckles. See? And, we went out, and then he went, boom! Again, this time he went over the back wheel and shook it. And eventually the rhino went backwards and retreated. <laughs> <laughs> I could listen to him all day. Um, so yeah, he sat down there, isn't he? he? But you can see Ben Affleck's like, you are the coolest man I've ever met. You know, still holds your attention. You can still imagine. So you can, you're imagining the football with Robin Williams, but you're just imagining it just as vividly, the rhino with David Attenborough. So it doesn't matter if you're sat down. It doesn't matter if you feel like you can jump around in front of your audience. You can still convey passion and interest. And if you're interested and passionate in your talk and what you're talking about, that will make your audience do it. It's no good you say, well, I'm, mm, 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 mm. if you're not interested in the topic, your audience will be interested in your topic. And it all just comes down to practice, really. Practice, practice, practice. Who's that? Corey McElroy. Is that me? That is an example of me? Yeah? He's... I don't think there'd be a guy scared if it was me doing my, uh, practicing my driving. I'm uh, obviously very uh, confident that Rory's going to smack it all the way up there, but yeah. He's not just got one ball, has he? He's got several there, he's got a few more. He's doing the same shot over and over again. And it's all about practicing the delivery, and every time you do a presentation, sometimes something will work, sometimes something doesn't work, and you take that with you and you go forward. So, time for a little bit of an exercise. There's no big bits of paper or anything like that. But with the person sort of sat in a, maybe in a three or a four, I just want you to think now, you're doing a talk on clinical red flags and bias. Can you think of one or two slides that aren't relying just on bullet points that you might come up with that sort of convey the importance of red flags and bias in everything? If you, if you say to yourself, how am I going to do this without just relying on a PowerPoint, how interesting and different things you can come up with, and it's just different, and then your audience has sat through so many meeting uh, presentations with all of just the words, they're going to see, well, this is a bit different, dreams a bit different, so this is not what I'm used to. So um, I've done a few sessions on bias and red flags uh, with the med students and also with James' students, so I'm just going to share some of, my, uh, some of the ways I've approached it. Uh, one of the things I like to say to my, the audience is, what colour is this dress? Yeah, that's like yeah. White gold. White gold. I saw white gold on the other side, but that one's been obliged. I think we're wearing black. 
Yeah. It's white and gold. Yeah. That is the same colour as that to me. That's red. That's yeah, uh, blue. Fine. No, but this is it. So this is it. So imagine you're doing a session on bias. You put this up as your first slide and say to your ones, "What colour is it?" I, um, breaks the ice, gets people talking, and it illustrates the point that I could be in a, a you know an audience of nurses, CSWs, and I show this and I go, "I think this is white and gold," and then they're going, "This is a doctor. What the hell? Why is he think?" You know, it illustrates that point. Sometimes you do think, "Why did this person think this patient had such condition?" When you follow them up further down the road. And sometimes that's because of biases that are out of our control. I, it's part of the things to do with my eyes, same as way with um, Max and Jacks. We can't help but that we see this as white and gold instead of blue and black. I know that it is actually blue and black in real life before anybody mentions that. Another one I would say to the audience is what animal made this? Is it a zebra or is it a horse? So this is like a patient coming in with shortness of breath. Is it a PE? Is it asthma? Is it a zebra? Is it a horse? You get a bit more information. Look at where you are, maybe. Is it a zebra? Is it a horse? What animal? What animal is this? I think it's a zebra. Zebra. Illustrates that point. As you go further along, you get a bit more information. So this asthmatic, you think it's all due to asthma? Turns out she's recently been on a flight. She's on the oral contraceptive pill. Uh, she's got a family history of blood clots. Get a bit more information and actually sometimes the less common thing can come through. Who's this guy? Wally. Wally! I want you to imagine that Wally is a patient with uh, a ruptured AAA. You've got in your mind's eye what a ruptured AAA looks like, what it sounds like, etc, etc. Just like you've got in your mind's eye what Wally is. There's your screaming room. Where's the AAA? There he is, right in the middle. Where's the wizard? Where? Can you see the wizard? Can you see the bad the bad guy? The thing on the left. Yeah, there's the bad guy. And there is a wizard with a red uh, robe and a blue hat. You see him? No. Oh, yeah. So, this, I think, just illustrates that point very easily. And then now, if I go back, go, where's Wally? Straight away, there you are. Go straight to your mind's eye. And that's kind of like that. Whenever you see a patient who turns out to have something rare, who you so, you know, I've seen a patient who I thought was an MI, turned out it was an aortic dissection. The very next week, the first patient I see with chest pain, I'm immediately thinking this must be a dissection. I'm going straight to that thing. Actually, that patient turned out to be a PE or something else. And that's, that's a way of introducing a, a, a difficult idea, maybe, that you just couldn't maybe get across in words or will take a lot of words. Finally, um, another thing on red flags, I want you to imagine that you're swimming out at sea and you see this going past you. Is it a dolphin? Is it a shark? Is it your pa patient comes in with back pain? Is it they've just pulled a muscle? Or is it quadriquina? Or is it a triple A? Is it a dolphin that's just going to swim around you and be happy? Or is it a great white shark? You think it's a shark? You can follow it up with something like that. Memorable. Don't delay in AAA. You're not going to wait. You're not going to waste time. You're just going to get out of there, aren't you? You're not going to waste time if you think a patient might have a AAA. You're going to deal with it. You don't want to get bitten. Finally, I just want to talk a bit on uh, audience engagement. This is another one of my favourite films, and I think it's... Uh, I think we've all been in teaching a bit like this. Hopefully, my teaching's not been like this. Um, this is from Ferris Bueller's Day Off. In 1930, the Republican-controlled House of Representatives, in an effort to alleviate the effects of the anyone, anyone, the Great Depression, passed the anyone, anyone, the tariff bill, the Hawley-Smooth 
tariff act, which anyone raised or lowered, raised tariffs <laughs> in an effort to collect more revenue for the federal government. Did it work? Anyone? Anyone know the effects? <coughs> it did not work, and the United States sank deeper into the Great Depression. Today, we have a lot of debate over this. Anyone know what this is? Well, anyone? The Laffer curve. Anyone know what this says? It says that at this point, we will get exactly the same amount of revenue as at this point. This is very controversial. Does anyone know what Vice President Bush called this in 1980? Anyone? Something D O O economics. Voodoo economics. Yeah. Were your teenagers anything like that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've all had sessions like that, haven't we, where you feel like you're maybe talking to a brick wall. Um, how would you rate his sort of audience engagement on a scale of 1 to 10? Yeah, he's got a consistent tone of voice, yeah. Uh, he's got audience uh, members fast asleep, one of them chewing gum, one of them looking at him with absolute resentment at one point as well. So, we want to engage our audience. Uh, sometimes you will have an audience that you just, they're not getting it, they're not buying what you're saying. But I think sometimes other things like shyness comes into it. So, and the sheer audience volume. So when I, I've delivered talks where it's just to a few people, or I've done it to 200 people. And that audience of 200 people, you're less likely to get that engagement because it's a big crowd and getting them to talk. Also, I've delivered sessions such as the introductory lecture for the third years when they started the clinical phase. They're all shy, they're all scared, they're wearing clinical clothes for the first time. Expecting them to engage with me and answer questions is just not going to happen. There's always going to be one person who's going to answer every question, and the people over there at the back are just not going to uh, pay attention. So there's a number of things that you can do. So this is, a, what's, uh, this is called Tweet Deck. As you know, I love a bit of tweeting and Twitter. Okay. Free to use. Uh, what you need to do is open up your uh, Twitter account and then open up another window and go to TweetDeck. And what it allows you to do is write a tweet, but then you can schedule it. You can delay your tweeting. So if you know that you're delivering a talk, you can say, I, I, I know that at 10.30 I will be talking about such and such. I want to tweet a link to that. And I can then say to my audience, have a look at it. And hopefully, my Twitter page has tweeted a number of things. This is where oh. So yeah, presenting on PowerPoint is a crutch. There's a tweet from me that I scheduled to tweet during this. And then I could put up a link, so I could then put up a link, say, to the NHS CT head guidelines. And then that comes up on, I'll know that'll be on my Twitter, pay, uh, on my Twitter feed. Okay. If people aren't on Twitter, I can put a hashtag in it, say hashtag McDreamy tweeting or something, and just ask them to Google that hashtag, and it will come up with the, uh, with the tweet. And so then they can use that. And it's a way of engaging. For those of you who were at EM2C a few weeks ago, Damien Rowland, one of the consultants from Leicester, who's a big fan of this, he mentioned, and I think it's very true, Students and audience members now coming to these things don't just expect to sit there and have a PowerPoint for you to read off. If they think that, they're going to be shortchanged. Education is very expensive these days, courses are expensive. <coughs> they want something more to go forward, and this is an example of that. If you know that you're going to be doing something at a certain time, if you tweet deck it, it'll come up. Mentimeter. So I'm a big fan of Mentimeter. I hope this will work. This is where we go. Use your phone, go to www.menti.com and there's your code. I hope this will work. Mine works if I switch off the Wi Fi, but then I'm with the EE, so I do get a signal. Uh, So this is an example of the sort of things that you can do. If you've got an audience group there, you can put something up like this going, 
you know. It's not just a meal. No. <laughs> <laughs> but you can imagine if you were doing a more serious presentation, you could use this for something. So, you know, what category should a triple A be? Category one, two, eight, for example. Mm. And it's a way of getting your audience to talk if they're a bit shy, you know, if they don't want to make mistakes, you can put it along like that. What's interesting in this is I think the, the use of more technology in talks has changed talk etiquette. There used to be a thing you've all got to be staring at the speaker and it's rude if not. Whereas now the more um, uh, presentations I go to, you see people sat there with their phone out, tweeting and doing things like this. Is anybody getting signal? Yeah, I've got the option to put jackets in my phone. Um, I can't have a No. So you get us two or three slides for free, and then after that you do have to pay a fee. But it could be possible then to have a dream account that everybody then has access to. So this is my personal one because I, I you know, I wanted to have one, but it would be possible to have one. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Whoever that was. Thank you, Matt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, one vote each. Yeah. One vote each. Yeah. I'm, so proud, I'm just sad it's from you, and, right, but never mind, anyway. So that's one example of sort of talks you can have. Uh, we'll move on for the sake of time. But here's a scale, so from one to 10. But you can imagine this is like a Leichhardt scale. So you could do a before and after survey. You know, how confident do you feel about CPR? If you saw your friends at a party having a, a, half, yeah, having a, a cardiac arrest, what would you do? You know, and you, how confident would you be to help? And you can have a, a one to ten thing going along there. Thank you again, Matt. <laughs> yeah, so this again goes into it. So a few weeks ago, this wouldn't have been a problem. We've been affected with the, and so the Wi-Fi here has been affected. And if you're going elsewhere, you would have to say, so when I, when I did this with the students, I told I asked Nick beforehand, can you guarantee there will be really good Wi-Fi? Because I know it's people, everyone has a smartphone, I can guarantee that, but it's about getting the Wi-Fi. And if you match, so that's a, this is a good pre and post sort of survey thing. How confident do you feel? It makes a like art scale. Good. <laughs> Or you can get a word that I'll go, but you can set a profanity filter, which I have done on this one. <laughs> Coward. But say you were doing a session on uh, the acute abdomen. You could then say, what do you think about the acute abdomen in three words? And you can get, at the beginning, people to mention words. You know, what is shock? What do you think about ECGs? And just see what comes up. And then that's the starting point. It allows people to share their feelings without speaking, without thinking, well, if I say that, am I going to look like an idiot? Because we're all a bit like that, aren't we? Nobody wants to be the one person in the room that doesn't know what a AAA is. Enigmatic, delicious, beautiful, boring. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> Enigmatic. <laughs> <laughs> beautiful, yeah. Yeah. Stirred, more is beautiful, delicious, conservative. Then <laughs> 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 Start, starts getting a few. And so the more work time something is said, the bigger the word is. So that's that sort of thing that comes into it. So you might then notice a theme. So if you say, just describe shock, you might find that. Oh, <laughs> obviously, some profanity does. Damn. <laughs> And that one's only one vote, because you don't want it the big vote. No, beautiful, yes, sir. When you say, so just talk about shock, hypotension would then be a big word, wouldn't it? Tachycardia would be big words. So you go, yeah, this is the sort of things you can talk about. Is everybody finished, or is there anybody still wanting to, to, get, their, to get their words up on there? Okay. Yeah, I don't think we'll do this with you, nine. <laughs> 
Yeah, maybe that one's not. What you can also do is have a quiz. So, whereas that first one, there wasn't really a right or a wrong answer, you could have multiple choice. On this one, you can put in a quiz that actually has a definite right answer. So it has a, has a countdown. Who is my favourite James Bond? One of them is right, one of them is not. <laughs> that would be cheating. Is this personal or you? This is me. Yeah. This is me. Who is my favourite James Bond? Ah. One got it right. All of them? Yes. Yeah. It's one of our butchers in Ashford. So some people like Pierce. Yeah. My mum's yeah. my mum's a big Pierce fan. She also likes Sir Roger and Preston oh, Pete. I, I do like Daniel, oh, no. but Timothy is still my favourite. Yeah. So this is a free text option that puts things up in bubble. So this is different to the word cloud, but you could say this at the end of your talk to say, so what will you take from here? So say you've done a talk on ECGs. How, we, what are you going to take? What's the one thing you take from this? And it creates a wall like that. So it might say something like, I will now make sure all chess leads are in the right place. And so you, you get that sort of thing, rather than people being expected to put their hand up, do it this way. Well done. Whoever <laughs> yeah, put that, who put that? Well done, whoever it was. Can you tell me it's a No, it's anonymous. It does record the results, and I'll show you that in a bit. It was about. Something like that, but you can buy a 12 month contract where it's a bit less a month, or you can buy it month by month, also it's more expensive. Means equals smiley face, always P3, good, Twitter, good, these are all good. But then that's that thing, isn't it? It's showing you can do the like half scale for before and after, you can get your audience involved, and then you can show you know, so how do you, uh, where are you going to go from here? Eventually. So for the sake of... I missed that one, I Yeah, we'll, we'll finish on that one. I probably know a lot of one. So then, when you finish, so all those results are now recorded, I can press on here, and it will export results as an Excel, for, uh, as an Excel file. So it downloads all of them. So say you've got a survey pre and after, and you don't want to be going through all that paper, I'm sure Jack will say it's a nightmare. You can do it all off here, and it creates an Excel file for you automatically. So you don't have to go through any of that before and after stuff. You can ask the same sorts of questions, you can do the same sort of like art scales, but it's just automatic and it makes it as an Excel. Yes, of course. So, so it's just that quickly, and then click on it. And then there it goes, an Excel format file. Oh, that's cool. mm. Click on it. Ah. And it's impossible to get like a company one, or do you, is it personal? So you could have a dream one, as long as everybody knows the username, the username and the password, you can all log in. And there you go. So all of your voters, so you could have a whole, you could have as many as you want, and you'd get your answers. Okay. And then like that. And then nobody's had to go through loads of paperwork. We've saved on paper. We've saved on time. And it's just there. And how quick was that? Where would you get the picture for the uh, word map? So there it is. Enigmatic, delicious. So one person put those three. One person put those three. One person put just not. <laughs>
<laughs> no, sadly, it is completely anonymous, which is annoying. You could do the process of elimination, kind of. You could do the process of elimination. <laughs> so, so that's Mentimeter. Um, just before we finish, does anyone know what this is? QR. It's a QR code. So, this is a QR code that I made using. So it's just like with the um, with the meme, it's an online QR code generator, nice and free. I put in the link to the nice CT head guidelines. All you need to do is scan it. Where do you scan it? Where do you scan it? Do you have to have so an you get a free app with a QR scanner. So you just say to your audience, "I'd like to get the app." It's nice and free. I scan that, and there's the CT head nice guidelines automatically to my phone. It's called QR. It's a QR code. Capital Q, capital R. And that's directly to that. So I can put that up and go, right guys, I want you to all do that. Again, it saves on paper, saves on time. There's your, and then they can take that away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. What you need is just a, a free app. So it's a QR scanner, it's called QR code scanner. Nice and free, completely free. Download it, make sure you've already got that before they come along. You can put those in, scan it, and away you go. And that could be a link to the Dream website, it could be a link to something else you've done, say I, I've written a blog on this, scan to that link and there you go, some further reading. And it just looks like you've prepared, it looks like you've come along with something and it's sort of, you know, a bit cool. As I said, I'm a geek, I think it's sort of cool. Yeah. Is that easy to create that? Completely. It's called QR Code Generator, there's loads of them free, like the Meme Generator. All you need to do is copy the URL, paste it in and you get that. Most, most websites have their own uh, Some do, some don't. Uh, the nice one, I don't know if it does. I didn't look, didn't bother looking. But, you know, the Dream website could have one, and then different bits of the Dream website could have one, and then there you go. And again, like you said, it's just about making sure, A, you've got the Wi-Fi, but it's about saying beforehand, welcome to Dream, we ask that you bring a smartphone, and could you please make sure you have a QR code scanner on there for this sort of thing. And then it's, it's easy. All I did was go to iTunes, QR code scanner, a matter of seconds that I had it downloaded on my phone, and there it goes. One option. Cool. So where to from here? So this is the website of Ross Fisher again. Uh, I really recommend it. He's got a few blogs, he's got some videos of him presenting and things like that, so I really recommend it. Um, he's become a bit of a guru of mine. And he tweeted me once. Um, which means we're friends. Um, yeah. Stay away from me. Yes. Who are you? What are you? Why are you wearing purple? Go away. Yes. Sheldon. 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 Yeah. <laughs> the restraining order is in the post. Yeah, absolutely. I know a great place is TED. Has anyone seen TED, yeah. the website? They basically got talks on everything, and I went on here to look. I don't mind admitting this. See what's out there beforehand, before, because you don't want to reinvent the wheel and they talk about everything. And it's great examples of how to be a good presenter because they don't just stand there in front of a slide full of words, they really show something. They do do podcasts, yeah. They've got a TED session in Leicester in a couple of months' time, I believe. Yeah, they travel the world. So TED Talks are really good. I'd like to thank you all for listening. Yes. <laughs> 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 Someone's wearing some some very restraining uh, <laughs> underwear. The sad thing is, I probably would have known. He was just like, how come you look so good? Um, no, look like that. There you go. Anyway. About ten years. Sorry. That is, um, oh, what's her name? Sabrice from Skyfall. This is the Skyfall one. So thank you for listening. I hope I've not bored you. I hope you're feeling a bit inspired. I will, in honour of yesterday, I will leave the final words to the late, great Sir Roger Moore. Nobody does! Always end on a music.